Joan Crawford died and I was disinherited, there was a lot of um, sort of nasty, why does she disinherit her children, whatever, whatever. And I got... I can still manage it quite well. That's not really I think this is far more sexy than complete nudity. Well, I think I still use certain qualities of it and certain phases of it. It's uh, very helpful to me. Hollywood has long harbored its fair share of concealed scandals and shadowy tales, and among them is the chilling narrative of Joan Crawford, often referred to as Mommy Dearest. Shockingly, her daughter Christiana has recently come forward to unveil the grim secrets of her mother's past. According to Christiana, Joan Coward was involved in the clandestine adoption of youngsters who had been forcibly separated from their biological parents. It is alleged that a number of these unfortunate individuals were acquired by some of Hollywood's biggest celebrities. However, it appeared that Joan was the supplier. I got tired of it. I really got tired of always having to explain, always having to defend myself. And I thought, I'm just going to sit down and tell the truth. Joan Crawford, a prominent figure, was known for several facets of her life. Her infamous feud with Bette Davis, her ability to wield her femininity to control situations, and her philanthropic endeavors, which included five private adoptions throughout her lifetime, are among them. Notably, her second adopted child, a son, was reclaimed by his birth mother within a year of the adoption. Now, you're, you have a brother uh, who... Uh is all through the book, of course, whom you're very close to. Yes. And he isn't doing all that well, is he? However, in 1978, shortly after Crawford's passing, her eldest adopted daughter, Christina Crawford, released a revealing memoir titled Mommy Dearest. This memoir painted a much darker and harrowing picture of the actress, portraying her as a drunk and a mother prone to violent outbursts. The truth was something that a lot of people knew, but many people were unwilling to acknowledge. While the public was aware of the strained relationship between mother and daughter, particularly after 1968, when a 29-year-old Christina took a medical leave of absence from her CBS soap opera, The Secret Storm and her mother, then in her 60s, replaced her. The memoir shocked everyone. It's believed that Crawford was aware of the book's existence before her death in May 1977, but she had never discussed it with Christina. In her will, she excluded both Christina and her brother Christopher for reasons they were supposedly aware of, leaving her assets to her twin daughters, Kathy and Cindy, as well as to charity. However, the disowned children later contested and won their claim to the estate. It was, a, it was originally a term of endearment that uh, we used as children, and uh, later on it was the way that my mother insisted that we address her. Since then, the accuracy of the events described in the memoir has been widely debated and examined. Christina released updated editions of her book to mark its 20th and 30th anniversaries, while other memoirs such as Not the Girl Next Door, Joan Crawford, A Personal Biography and Possessed, have sought to challenge the claims made in Mommy Dearest. Additionally, a campy and almost satirical 1981 film of the same title, starring Faye Dunaway, further added to the debate. We are living here, right now. Obviously, she cannot be controlled in this environment. Nothing really happened between your daughter and the young man. It was innocent. No. Anyways, for Christina Crawford, her belief that her mother loved her shattered when she was just 13 years old. This was a young age to come to such a heart-wrenching realization, one that profoundly altered her perception of the world's benevolence. She recalls an incident at this age when her mother violently grabbed her by the throat, punched her in the face, and slammed her head against the floor. You never forget that, Christina said, 55 years later. It was up close and personal. She came this far from my face and you could see it in her eyes. You can see if someone is trying to K you. To the wider public, Joan Crawford was a vastly different figure from the A and volatile parent described by her daughter, Christina. She was not perceived as an alcoholic prone to sudden bursts of violence, nor as the tyrannical figure who unleashed her fury behind closed doors. In the eyes of everyone else, she was simply Joan Crawford, the iconic Hollywood movie star. So a lot of people said, True, this is fiction, you know, that kind of thing. So then I wrote my second book, which was a novel, and they said, oh, she writes novels. 
During the 1940s, at the pinnacle of her fame, Crawford held a considerable reputation to maintain. She was one of the original studio ingenues, an actress who had risen from a challenging childhood to become one of the highest paid women in the industry. Her career spanned five decades, during which she starred alongside legendary figures like Clark Gable in Possessed and Bette Davis in Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. She even secured a Best Actress Academy Award in 1945 for her role in Mildred Pierce. Crawford resided in an expansive estate in Brentwood, Los Angeles, and leveraged her wealth to adopt and raise four children, including Christina. This act was highly celebrated in extensive magazine features that portrayed her as a loving mother with a seemingly happy family life. However, Christina's perspective starkly contrasted with this public image, viewing it as a deceptive facade. It was the hypocrisy of it that was so difficult, she says. People fantasized about who or what I was, that I had this privileged, wealthy, film star family life. I didn't have any of that. About a year after her mother's passing, attributed to a heart attack at the age of 69, 72, or 73, depending on which birth date you subscribe to, Christina's pent-up frustration with the stark contrast between Joan Crawford's private life and her public image came to a head. In 1978, Christina published Mommy Dearest, a scathing autobiography that depicted Joan Crawford as a sadistic perfectionist and an alcoholic prone to unpredictable fits of maternal rage, punishing even the mildest transgressions with excessive severity. What it did is it switched the whole story from being the story of the child suffering the abuse and trying to live through it and survive. This groundbreaking work was the first tell-all celebrity memoir and the initial book to candidly and vividly address a childhood allegedly marred by both psychological and physical A. In the years following its release, the offspring of other Hollywood legends, including Bette Davis and Bing Crosby, penned similarly searing accounts of their own parental experiences. The 1981 film adaptation, starring Faye Dunaway, became a cult classic. Joan Crawford's reputation sustained a relentless assault that it has never fully recovered from. My secretary lives a block from me. Okay. And she's in Los Angeles and I'm in Hollywood, or I'm in Hollywood or she's in Los Angeles, so I don't know the difference. Right. To this day, most people associate Joan Crawford with a notorious scene from both the book and the film, wherein she erupts into a vicious tirade upon discovering Christina's clothes hanging on wire hangers. No wire hangers! became a phrase in common parlance, symbolizing neurotic maternal instability. In another harrowing recollection, Christina describes her mother dragging her out of bed in the middle of the night at the age of nine and beating her over the head with a can of scouring powder for leaving soap streaks on a bathroom floor. One of the very serious problems in this country, and probably many other countries, is child abuse. Yes, I, I think serious. it's... I think it's fair to say that uh, it's reached almost epidemic proportions. Now. Three decades after the initial release of Mommy Dearest, Christina Crawford reissued the book with a new introduction and afterward, corroborating testimonies from contemporaries and over 100 pages of photographs that had been excluded from the 1978 edition. Nonetheless, Christina faced her share of critics, but she was also supported by her fans. One of them wrote, I believe every word about Christina's abuse. I was raised in a house with four kids and was on the receiving end of my father's loathing for the sin of looking like my mother. When I went to a school counselor and told them about it, I was about eight, I begged them not to tell him I was there and told them about the abuse. By the time I got home, he had already been informed. Because he was president of the PTA and an eligible bachelor, I had to be lying. It continued till I was married, and the emotional abuse continued till I cut him off. I wasn't even mentioned in his obituary. Christina was not making it up. Christina Crawford was the eldest of Joan's adopted children and became part of Joan Crawford's family in 1939. Prior to adopting Christina, Joan Crawford had made an attempt to adopt another child, but this child was subsequently reclaimed by their birth mother. From the outside, the story of five children rescued from abandonment and embraced by one of the world's most renowned actresses might have appeared to be a real-life fairy tale. However, in her autobiography, Christina Crawford unveiled a deeply disturbing narrative. 
Contrary to the image of Joan as a generous and caring mother, Christina revealed that Joan was an A who subjected her adopted children to both physical and emotional A. Something would have taken my mother like a possession almost, and uh, she, she did have a drinking problem in those oh, yes. years, I which uh, uh, I, I don't think was well known. Christina detailed how she and her brother, Christopher, bore the brunt of this A. Christopher was reportedly secured to his bed each night with a harness to prevent him from getting up to use the bathroom. One particularly infamous episode, which became the most well-known scene in both the book and the movie, involved Joan flying into a blind rage after discovering a prohibited wire hanger in her daughter's closet one night. The Oscar-winning actress ripped the clothes off their hangers and flung them all onto the floor before seizing Christina by the hair. Christina Crawford recalled how, with one hand she pulled me by the hair and with the other she cuffed my ears until they rang all the while screaming, no wire hangers, before proceeding to destroy Christina's part of the room and then ordering her to clean up your mess. The autobiography quickly skyrocketed to the top of the bestseller list, and the phrase no more wire hangers has since become a ubiquitous pop culture reference. For numerous individuals, Joan Crawford's image has been forever altered, with her being remembered as a disturbed mother rather than the sophisticated star she was known as. The book and the subsequent film gained such immense popularity that the tales of Joan Crawford's cruelty began to be treated as established facts by many. Nevertheless, many individuals who were intimately connected to her were swift to defend her and challenge the accounts presented by Christina Crawford. Those are two separate issues. The, the success of the book, I came to understand that the reason it was so successful is because it told the story of so many millions of people. In an interview with The Guardian, Christina Crawford revealed even more harrowing details about the A she endured, alleging that she was strangled, physically A, and nearly lost her life at the hands of the late Hollywood actress who had adopted her in 1940. The writer of the interview expressed the belief that if Joan's actions had occurred in modern times, she would have faced legal consequences and potentially been charged with attempted murder. However, due to the absence of robust child protection laws during Christina's youth, Joan managed to escape accountability for her manipulative and abusive behavior. She said, she would have been in jail. She would have been hauled off to jail for attempted murder. What is the excuse for that? There's no excuse. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. That's not the issue. And that's not my responsibility anyway. Christina was sent to boarding school at the tender age of 10, but it wasn't until a few years later at the age of 13 that she began to comprehend the gravity of Joan's actions and the feeling of entrapment. It became clear to her that there was no legal framework in place to protect her until she reached the age of 18. She explained, I was 13 or 14, and it was then that I realized the world had gone insane. The officer was very kind. He told me that there was nothing he could do because there were no laws to protect me. He told me, you have to try to live here until you are 18 and can go free. But otherwise, if anyone calls me again on you, you'll have to go to juvenile detention. Child protection laws in the United States were not implemented until the 1960s, and it wasn't until 14 years later that the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act was enacted. Christina has expressed deep gratitude for her late brother, considering him a lifesaver, as she fears what might have transpired without him being there as a witness to their shared ordeal. Yes, I, I, was, I was four years old, uh, or maybe five at the most, and I had to take a nap every afternoon. And I was uh, sort of daydreaming. In her last years, Christina relocated to Idaho, and despite being excluded from Joan's will along with her brother Christopher, she gradually came to terms with the traumatic experiences she endured. She said, But you come to terms with it. I honestly don't think it controls me anymore. It is something that you have to live through, and it's very difficult, because there's no roadmap for it, even today. Generally speaking, we don't recognize the long-term psychological damage that is inflicted on people who are abused, neglected, and T. It is hard for people to understand that what happened 20 years ago is creating behavior patterns today. In Joan's later years, she and Christina lost touch as Joan grappled with alcohol and D-related issues. Tragically, Joan passed away from a heart attack during this difficult period. In 1981, Christina herself faced a personal crisis when she suffered a stroke. She then embarked on a five-year journey of recovery from this health setback. I consider you inspirational. I must Thanks. tell you this because what you went through, a lesser person could be neurotic or psychotic at this particular time, and you seem to have your head together. 
There are various theories about why Joan Crawford exhibited a behavior towards her daughter. One significant factor is her own adoption, which may have influenced her parenting. Additionally, the orphanage from which she was adopted had questionable practices and was under the leadership of Georgia Tan, a notorious baby broker known for orchestrating the illegal adoption of young people who were often taken from their biological parents. An adoption scandal that shocked the nation, a villain hiding in plain sight, and over 5,000 children whose lives would never be the same. Georgia Tan once had a good reputation, working at the Tennessee Children's Home Society to expedite the adoptions of numerous babies who had been given up by their parents. Yet it came to light years later that she actually managed the sale of essentially black market youngsters. An estimated 5,000 children were black market sold through Georgia Tan's adoption ring. Sadder still, many of the adoptive families had no idea what they were supporting. No one knows or perhaps cares to remember the exact day the Tennessee Children's Home Society in Memphis closed. What is known is that 69 years ago, in late November or early December, the place workers later called a house of horrors closed its doors for good. While the closure itself may have pushed the home into obscurity, the profound impact it had on the lives of over 5,000 children lingers in memory. What makes this story particularly haunting is not just the fact that many of the children experienced orphanhood or A, but that they were actually stolen. The truth is the majority of these children were kidnapped, taken, were confiscated under false means. Georgia Tan would target poor families, poor families who could not fight back. For over two decades, Georgia Tan operated the Tennessee Children's Home Society using an intricate network of collaborators to engage in a horrifying enterprise of kidnapping and mistreatment. Their sinister objective was to abduct children and then sell them to affluent adoptive parents for a substantial profit. One of Tan's preferred tactics was to cruise through impoverished neighborhoods, singling out the most attractive children and enticing them into her sleek, black luxury car. Once these children were in her custody, they were often never reunited with their families. Children would be taken away under the guise of something good and never be given back. Tan capitalized on the lack of adoption regulations at the time, exploiting the desperation of prospective parents to ensure their silence. Investigations conducted after the closure of the home revealed that many children perished while under Tan's supposed care. Those who did survive their time at the Tennessee Children's Home Society still bear the emotional scars of Tan's unchecked cruelty and unbridled greed. Sally Brandon is one of the few Children's Home Society adoptees who still remember Tan. She was a rounded lady who wore glasses and carried a little purse, Brandon told Insider. I remember her being a stern, severe woman. Brandon and her two brothers were separated and sold by Tan. With their blonde hair and blue eyes, the trio was perfect prey for Tan. She pocketed close to $2,700 in the deal, nearly $40,000 in today's money. She regularly took babies from patients at mental hospitals, stole children from the street, and even paid doctors and nurses to give her newborns and tell the parents they had died. Tan would then change their names so that they were hard for biological parents to track down. This was no small operation. Between 1924 and 1950, Tan stole over 5,000 children, 500 of whom died while in her care. Tan even took out newspaper ads featuring beautiful children with captions such as, want a real live Christmas present? As if they were merely playthings. Georgia Tan would be given a tip that these children were left alone. She would then drive to these houses in her black luxury Packard car, offer the children a ride and lure them out of their homes. Throughout her operation, Georgia Tan managed to keep the origins of the children she provided a closely guarded secret, despite occasional whispers of suspicion. Some of her most prominent clients were wealthy, particularly well-known actors and actresses who could easily afford the substantial fees required to obtain a child, which amounted to $5,000 at the time. Furthermore, they could bypass the waiting periods associated with legitimate adoption agencies and avoid taking time away from work due to pregnancy. Georgia Tan acquired babies to sell was by taking advantage of desperate mothers who were not pregnant in a socially acceptable way. Among the notable figures who used the Tennessee Children's Home Society's services were celebrities like Mary Pickford, Smiley Burnett, Lana Turner, Pearl S. Buck, and former New York Governor Herbert Lehman. June Allison and her husband also adopted their daughter Pamela through the agency. 
Interestingly, historical photos from that era sometimes misrepresent Pamela as the biological child of June Allison's husband, Dick Powell, from his first marriage, rather than correctly identifying her as an adopted child. Celebrities like Joan Crawford, Pearl S. Buck, and even the New York governor adopted tan children. These celebrities and hundreds of average families all believed that they were giving these children a home that However, the most famous celebrity to turn to Georgia Tan Services was Joan Crawford. Facing her own challenges with childbirth, she chose adoption as a means to expand her family. Crawford opted not to engage with adoption agencies known for their strict criteria and regulations, as they would likely have rejected her application due to factors such as her age, public image, and marital history. So as her children's adoptions are from that orphanage, people believe that Joan herself was also involved in such activities. One internet user wrote, I believe Christina. I believe her because I had very sick parents who also had public masks, manipulated people into believing they were good parents, and who, behind closed doors, did things to their children that could have landed them in prison. I tell my sibling who is protective of our parents' reputation. They are a now. And I mean it." Another one added, Of course it was true. If you think logically about it, Joan Crawford had a reputation of being controlling and difficult while making her movies. So given that information, it only seems believable that she would feel comfortable to exert the same type of behavior towards her children, plus worse, since she would feel comfortable to express her complete control over them and manage to do it using whatever means necessary to do it. Joan Crawford's life story was, from the start, a carefully crafted narrative, a persona constructed by the Hollywood studio system. She was born as Lucille Lesueur in San Antonio, Texas, and her early years were marked by hardship as her father left the family when she was just a few months old. She was just wonderful. She was she was very kind, though she was strict. Growing up in deprivation, Crawford developed a strong aversion to dirt and disorder. Determined to escape her background, she entered the world of entertainment as a Broadway chorus girl, where her talents caught the eye of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer studio executives in 1924. They offered her a contract and ran a magazine competition to select a new name, as they found her birth surname too unfavorable. Joan Crawford was the winning entry. She severed ties with her family and climbed her way to stardom, reinventing herself as a legend with no connection to her past. You have made, oh golly, probably just about more pictures than any other woman I can think of, about 80. Is that correct? 80 films? Oh, I think people have made more than that. Photographs from that era capture a striking figure, with pronounced cheekbones accentuated by dramatic lighting, meticulously groomed eyebrows arching over her intense dark eyes. There was determination in her jawline and a hint of challenge in her gaze. Her charisma and commanding physical presence often helped her achieve her desires. I look for... Um, this is good practical information for me. Very, <laughs> very roles instead of the same one all the time, even though I did play Cinderella. For contrast. Later. She had four marriages and a series of relationships with both men and women, including a one-night liaison with Marilyn Monroe. Unable to have biological children, she turned to adoption, enlisting private brokers to bypass the typical restrictions placed on single, divorced women. One of the initial five children she adopted was reclaimed by his birth mother within days. Christina was successfully adopted in 1939, Christopher in 1943, and twins in 1947. I think the fairest and kindest thing to say is that their experience of childhood was quite different than mine. They were not born when some of the things that uh, happened to my brother. From an outside perspective, it seemed like a fairy tale family for four children who might have otherwise languished in care homes. However, appearances were deceiving. Joan Crawford told Christina that her biological mother had died in childbirth, but Christina eventually uncovered the truth in the early 1990s when researching her family history. Both of her biological parents were still alive. Christina remembers a childhood shaped by her mother's violent mood swings. One moment, her mother would buy extravagant party dresses for her, and the next, she would administer severe spankings with a hairbrush. Joan Crawford's fits of anger, drinking, and obsession with cleanliness grew more pronounced as her career started to decline. At the age of 37, she was declared box office poison by studio executives, and her self-esteem suffered irreparable damage. For a woman who had defined her self-worth through her work, this was a devastating loss. 
It was complete and total hypocrisy between the public and the private. She adopted us for the publicity, she says. I have tremendous concerns about celebrity adoptions by people like Madonna and Angelina Jolie. From the adoptee's point of view, it is vitally important to know who they are, where they came from, or it can have profound medical and psychological effects. Throughout this time, the Crawford family's celebrity lifestyle was showcased in glossy magazine stories detailing the children's abundant birthdays and holidays. However, behind the glamorous facade and the flashes of the cameras, the reality was quite different and brutal, as described by Christina. Joan Crawford was neither the ideal mother any child could wish for, nor the artist the industry might have desired. Despite employing her persuasive and seductive tactics to ascend to a prominent position in the entertainment world, she was unable to secure a lasting place in her children's hearts. That's it for today, folks. Until next time, goodbye.